I'm going to talk to you about uh, market design, which is the engineering part of game theory. And I thought I'd begin, although I've already been introduced, I thought I'd begin by, by reflecting a little on my personal and professional history and the, and the history of game theory in OR. So I got my PhD in, in a department that no longer exists, the Operations Research Department at Stanford that, uh, that has since been merged into other departments. And when I was a graduate student, operations mostly meant the operations of firms that controlled all their assets and had a single objective function so that there weren't incentive problems. And I was drawn, though, to, to study problems with multiple decision makers where, where the incentives that, the different incentives that people had might be important in, in operations. And so I studied game theory. And it looked like game theory was going to really thrive in operations research as a discipline because in 1976, the new journal Mathematics of Operations Research was formed and it had uh, three areas and one of them was game theory. And the game theory editor was Bob Ullman, the best game theorist in the world. And so it looked like we were all set to go. And indeed, the, uh, the, the main account of my dissertation appeared in volume one, number one of MOR. It, you know, I was, I was ready. Um, but game theory languished in OR while it thrived in economics. Uh, because there wasn't yet an engineering part of game theory in the 1970s. So people often ask me how I switched from being an OR to being an economist. And my story, which I'm sticking to, is that I never switched, that the disciplinary boundaries switched. I was there doing game theory as part of operations research, and all of a sudden, what I was doing became economic. So I'm, I'm still doing what I set out to do. I want to tell you about that today. Um, it's a big part, it's, it's a growing part of economics, but of course, there are lots of opportunities for operations research in market design. So market design is the engineering part of game theory. And what we, what we think about are marketplaces. So marketplaces are the place where markets happen. You know, if you were studying the English language, the things you'd actually study would be books and speeches and conversations and tweets. When you're studying markets, the things you actually study when you're, when you're building them are marketplaces. And what I want to talk to you about today is sort of the opposite of a usual talk. Normally when I give a talk, I talk about all the novel new things we've done. But instead, I thought what I would try to emphasize today is how all the things we've done have their, uh, have some of their origins in, in deep, uh, venerable ideas from operations research. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about uh, medical labor market clearinghouses. Uh, if there's time, and there may not be, I'll talk to you a little about school choice systems. And then I'll talk to you a bit about, about kidney exchange. And the, the venerable operations research background that these things have is the medical labor markets and the school choice systems are in many ways built on deferred acceptance algorithms of the kind that Gale and Shapley told us about in 1962. And in kidney exchange, the, much of the work is, uh, is built on basic graph theory, including the kinds of contributions that uh, Galai and Edmund separately made in the 60s, uh, work that I did with, with right at the beginning of kidney exchange with my colleagues uh, Utko Unver and Typhoon Sunmez depended on that. And the work I'm doing these days with Itaya Schlagi depends on uh, random graph theory of the kind that um, uh, Erdo Shinrenyi uh, talked about in 1959. So, so rather than emphasize the, the newest things, the things that have happened since then, uh, <clears throat> as I tell you about the work we've done, I'm going to try to highlight how it, how it relates to those OR ideas that uh, certainly were available. I didn't necessarily know about them when I was a graduate student. So, <clears throat> so new doctors in the United States get their jobs through a kind of clearinghouse that arose in the 1950s after lots of market failures. So I won't tell you about those market failures today, but presently almost all the new doctors in the United States as they graduate from medical school go through something called the National Resident Matching Program. And it's a clearinghouse. They, they go on interviews. Uh, it looks like I'm missing a screen on that side, sorry. Uh, they, they go on interviews, they, uh, they, they engage with the, the, <clears throat> the programs that have agreed to interview them, and then rather than getting sequential offers, they fill out a rank order list. Here's my first choice job, my second choice, my third choice, and the jobs do that too. Here's my first choice. Uh, 
candidate, here's my second choice, here's my third choice, that's submitted to a centralized algorithm that I'll tell you a little about, to a centralized clearinghouse that uses a deferred acceptance algorithm to suggest a match. When I say suggest a match, this is a game theory problem. When this started in the 1950s, people didn't use the clearinghouse, and it was a voluntary procedure. They didn't have to use the clearinghouse. So in order for the clearinghouse to be effective, it had to capture the needs and desires of all the different participants. They couldn't just be told where to go as if they were machines being scheduled. So here's a, a little bit of a timeline. The, the way doctors get their jobs is individual medical graduates, individual doctors, medical students fill out a rank order list, as I just said, my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. But what I'm going to focus on today is the fact that today there are about 50% of our medical school graduates in the United States are women. And you know, medical school is a very busy time, but one of the things that medical students can sometimes manage to do is, is to marry their classmates. And so last year we had 1,800 uh, people going through the match as couples. That is, they needed to find two jobs. And the question is, how can we facilitate that? So I want to tell you a little bit about that uh, today. So to think about that, you have to think about what makes a clearinghouse successful and unsuccessful. Because the way I got into this was there had been a long history from the 1950s through the 1970s where the medical match was doing something, and it was quite successful. That is, uh, students were showing up in the jobs to which they had been matched. Hospitals were hiring them, the students were going there. Then around the 1970s, we started to see some couples. In, in the 1970s, about 10% of medical school graduates in the United States were women, and there started to be some couples, and the couples were not showing up where they were matched. They were showing up in other places, and that caused a ripple effect, and it grew and it grew. So I got involved in 95, and, and one of the things that I was asked to do was think harder about about couples. But first, you have to think, what's the match doing that made it successful in the first place? And so a hypothesis, uh, uh, stated simply here, is that a matching is stable if there aren't any doctors and residency programs who aren't matched to each other, but who would prefer to be. Remember, this is ultimately a voluntary program. So if, if there are doctors and, and hospitals not matched to each other who prefer to be, these are the guys who aren't going to show up where they're supposed to and aren't going to hire the people they're supposed to. And uh, the hypothesis, therefore, the, you know, based on this theoretical argument, is that clearing houses that are successful are the ones that produce stable matchings, and those that produce unstable matchings will have more trouble being successful. And when you look, it turns out there are labor clearing houses around the world that I studied, and you know, here's a list of them. And loosely speaking, what's going on in this uh, figure is that there's a column called stable, and if there's a yes there, it means it produces a stable match with respect to the stated preferences. And then I ask whether it's still in use, whether it succeeded in organizing the market. And what you see is, it's a small data set, but um, loosely speaking, a yes in the first column is associated with a yes in the second column. Not perfectly. There's, there's one yes in the first and no in the second, and there are a couple of no's in the first and yeses in the second. So one of the tools you can bring to bear on this kind of problem is experimental methods. Right? There are differences between Edinburgh and Newcastle that are different than how they organize their medical match. But in the laboratory, we can, we can focus just on how the algorithms work. And I'm not going to dwell on the evidence, but loosely speaking, let, let, summary is that there's good reason to believe that if we were going to make the medical match work, it would have to produce stable matchings. And that turns out to be hard to do with couples. So let me tell you how we produce stable matchings. Um, without couples, supposing we're in 1950 and all the medical school graduates are men. So here's uh, a, an algorithm that would do it. It's not exactly the one that they were using in 1950. This is the, uh, the deferred acceptance algorithm that Galen Shapley wrote about in 1962 in the American Math Monthly. Um, and so, so here's the algorithm. And, and I'm going to talk about it as if workers and firms are doing things. But the way you should think about this is, what everyone does is they submit a rank order list, and then all these steps are steps run in the clearinghouse algorithm. So the first step is each worker applies to his or her top choice firm, their first choice, their highest rank firm. Each firm that has, say, five positions holds the top five applications from its list, its first choice, second choice. Those, it looks at the five highest applications it's gotten, holds those, doesn't accept them yet, but doesn't reject them, and it rejects all the rest. It can only take five people, so if it has nine applications, it, it rejects the bottom four. Every worker who's just gotten a rejection applies to his 
next choice. Every firm that's just gotten new applications ranks them without prejudice about when they applied, just in order that they listed them in their rank order, keeps the five best if they've got five positions, rejects the rest. This algorithm continues until no more rejections are issued, which happens in finite time because there are only a finite number of people and no worker ever applies twice to the same firm. And at that time, when the, when the algorithm stops, the matches are made and every firm, every hospital residency program is matched to those applications that it's holding. Okay? And this produces a stable matching, a matching that doesn't have any of those blocking pairs because supposing I'm a student in that match and I'm matched to my third choice, my potential blocking pairs, the firms that I would prefer are my first choice and my second choice. How do I know they wouldn't also prefer me? Well, the reason I'm matched to my third choice is I first got rejected by my first choice and then I got rejected by my second choice. So although I would have preferred to work for them, they would not prefer to have hired me. So this is a stable matching. Now, when I first started to look into this procedure, what I found was in the 1950s, the, the medical match had done something equivalent to that. Not quite equivalent, but it produced a stable matching. So, so they'd anticipated Gale and Shapley's insight, although not their analysis. Um, but when couples started in the 1970s, when couples started to be a noticeable part of the, of the medical uh, labor force, they often were not found where they had been matched. That is, even if they entered the match and were matched, they, when you looked in July to see where they were, they weren't where they had been matched. And what that meant is that they were forming blocking pairs. They were getting on the phone and finding jobs they preferred and going to those jobs. And those jobs were therefore not hiring the people they were supposed to hire because they were hiring different people. So, so it was having a ripple effect. Uh, and this is why it's a game theory problem. You can tell them where to go, but you can't make them go there. So in the 1970s, the medical community tried to address this problem by having a couples algorithm. And the 1970s are a little longer ago than, than we sometimes remember. So the way the couples algorithm worked in the 1970s was first your dean had to certify you as a legitimate couple. And <laughs> once, once the dean had done that, um, then, uh, then you could enter as a couple. And you had to specify one member of the couple as the leading member. And both the leading member and the other member submitted rank order lists as if they were individuals. That is, the, the format of their list was just the same as if they were single doctors. And the way the algorithm tried to place couples with two jobs in the same city, which is often what they want, was the leading member would go through the match as an individual and get assigned to a job somewhere. Then the other member of the couple would have his or her rank order list edited to take out all the jobs that weren't in the same city. And then that member of the couple would go through the match. And this often produced uh, two jobs in the same city. But quite often, the people didn't end up in those jobs. When you looked where they were, they weren't there when, when it came time to start. Um, and why didn't this work well? Well, again, this is a game theory problem, but of course, it's not just a game theory problem between the doctors and the hospitals. Now there's couples involved too. And the iron law of marriage is that you can't be happier than your spouse. So, <laughs> so suppose that my wife and I have uh, our first choice jobs is two particular jobs in Boston. And you know, second choice, two particular jobs in New York, and third, two particular jobs in San Francisco. That's when we sit down over dinner, that's what we want. But they don't let us express that. They, I have to say, what's my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, and my wife does too. So supposing I'm the leading member, and uh, we go through the match, and, and I get a good job in Boston. And then they cross off all the non-Boston jobs for my wife, and then she gets another job in Boston, but not such a good job. Well, the iron law says we'd be better off at two good jobs in New York. So we get on the phone and we call up the New York hospitals and they say, oh, you know, we didn't know you were available. Uh, you know, we just happened to have an extra position. Why don't you come on down? And then they call up someone they were supposed to match to and they say, you know how deans are. We just had a budget cut and, and we're not gonna. So, um, so couples were not showing up where they were supposed to show up. Uh, but it's a tougher problem than that because you know, the deferred acceptance algorithm without couples, when I showed you Galen Chapley's theorem and, and showed that the deferred acceptance algorithm yields a stable match, that's a proof that stable matchings 
always exist, no matter what the preferences are, because I didn't tell you what the preferences were. I showed you a constructive algorithm that always produces a stable match. That's not true anymore when there are couples in the market. The set of stable matchings can be empty. And you can think about why the couples problem is hard by thinking about how the deferred acceptance algorithm is supposed to work. The reason there's a stable match when there are just single people in the deferred acceptance is that if I'm matched to my third choice job, then I know that my second choice job, which I would prefer, doesn't prefer me. But that's not true anymore when you have couples in the match, because let's think about that. Supposing my wife and I apply to two jobs in Boston, and we, they like us compared to the other people who've applied, so they don't reject us yet. Um, then someone else comes along and applies for the job that I'm holding, and they like that person better than me. So they reject me now and hold that other person. But now, in order for me to apply to my second choice, I'm, I'm a couple. I'm, it's me and my wife, and our second choice are two jobs in New York. So they have to, the algorithm has to take my wife out of the job that was holding her offer to allow us to apply to our next choice, which is two jobs in New York. Now, in order to hold my wife's uh, application, they had to reject some other people. But that would be great if they would get to hire my wife, but they didn't get to hire my wife. So now there are going to be these potential blocking pairs. We're going to have to remember that that hospital might not yet be part of a stable matching. It might regret that it, it rejected people. So, uh, so we're not going to have a one-pass algorithm anymore. And uh, instead, we're going to have a multi-pass algorithm that deals with this and other match problems. And I'm not going to go through it here, but, but loosely speaking, what's going on here is the left part of the flowchart is the deferred acceptance algorithm, just the way I showed it to you. And the right part says, Every time we pulled some member of a couple out of a hospital, let's put that hospital on a hospital stack and say, remember, there might be a blocking pair here, and so we're going to have to repair the blocking pairs one by one. And that might not work. It might cycle forever because there might not be a stable match. But one of the interesting empirical observations is we virtually never observe that. So for so we were luckier than we were entitled to be with what we knew. It turns out, although it's easy to produce little examples that there's no stable match when there's a couple, when you have lots of couples in a big market, when you have not too many couples in a big market, but when you have 1,800 couples in a market with 23,000 jobs, you almost never, ever find that you can't find a stable match. And we have a lot of data on this now because the, the roth Perenson algorithm, the algorithm that we use to organize these matches, is used in lots of annual labor markets, many of which have couples. And um, again, you virtually never find um, that you can't find a stable match. But we didn't have a good theoretical reason to understand this until very recently. So this was an empirical puzzle. How come the match was working so well when we knew that it didn't have to work well? And just recently, I'm not going to speak about that today, but Itai Ashlagi and his colleagues, Mark Braverman and Avinatan Hasidim, and Fuhito Kojima and Parag Patak and me have um, uh, written some papers that start to give us an idea of why in large markets the probability that you um, won't find a stable match if there aren't too many couples uh, becomes low. So, so one of the things that this engineering endeavor has led us to is, is, to, is a demand for a different kind of theory. Um, you know, in, when Marilda Sotomayor and I wrote a book in 1990 on matching, all the theorems were deterministic. But now we're starting to look for theorems that, that say not just you could run into a problem, but how likely is that problem to arise? And what we're finding in the case of couples is when the market's large, we can still find stable matchings if we go about it the right way. The, the 1970s algorithm had no chance of finding stable matchings because they didn't ask for the essential information, which is for a couple, what pair of jobs is your first choice, what pair of jobs is your second choice, and so forth. So let me take a couple of minutes to tell you about another application of deferred acceptance algorithms. So still, so modern developments here too, but 1962, Gale and Shapley. So a, a venerable OR result being put to an engineering use. Uh, a lot of American cities, a growing number of American cities, are now thinking about how to assign children to schools in ways that utilize to good effect the information that families have about which schools would be good for their children. So 
some cities still, of course, uh, send every child to the closest school to where he lives. I'm not talking about those cities. But loosely speaking, one of the problems we have in the United States is the problem that people who live in poor neighborhoods are often near poor schools. And so there's this effort to allow children to move around to get to better schools that, that their parents think would be better for them. A lot of things can go into that. So some of the procedures for doing that had the property that it wasn't safe for families to tell the school system where they wanted their kids to go to school. Notice again, this is a game theoretic problem. The information that we need to assign kids to schools is decentralized. Families have it. We're going to ask them, tell us where you'd like your kids to go. And sensibly enough, they're going to think to themselves, what are you going to use that information? How are you going to use the things I tell you? And will telling you the truth help me get what I want, or could I get what I want better some other way? And there were lots of school districts. So it's a game theoretic problem. Um, there were lots of school districts that had ways of asking that question that made it not safe for families to reveal to the, uh, the school board where they wanted to go. So let me tell you how it looked in the city of Boston. Uh, in the city of Boston, every child was assigned a, a priority at every school. And if, you had an, if an older sibling went to that school, that was the highest priority. If you were within the walk zone, that was a high priority. And after that, they broke ties with random numbers. People got a, a lottery number. And they had a very benign uh, way of assigning children to schools when more children wanted to go to some kindergarten class than it had positions for. Um, what they did is they said, we'll give as many people as possible their first choice. And then when we've done that, we'll give as many of those who remain their second choice. And then as many of those who remain their third choice. So that's a very simple algorithm to describe. It clearly is benignly motivated. But it turns out it's a very hard one to figure out, if you're a parent, how you should fill out your form. Because if you don't get your first choice, there's an excellent chance that your second choice will have filled all of its places with people who listed it as, its first choice, as their first choice. So if you don't get your first choice, there's a good chance you won't get your second choice or your third choice, which will be filled with people who listed it as their first or second choice, and you'll drop down through the system to a school that has empty places after everyone has gotten all their choices. And that would be a, a bad outcome. And so families had to think very hard about how to fill out their preference list so that they'd have a good chance of getting the school they named as their first choice. Now, of course, that's different from the school that's their first choice, which means the school district wasn't working with the information it needed to, uh, to elicit from families to know where, where they would like their kids to go. So uh, you couldn't get in to your second choice school if you didn't list it first, even if you had the highest priority, right? Even if you had an older child who already went to that school. So you would surely get into that school if you listed it first. You probably couldn't get in if you listed it second. So what families did is they listed first the schools their kids could get into. And it looked great, therefore. Everyone was getting their first choice. And the, the city was quite happy. And, but they invited us to, to talk to them about it and eventually changed to a deferred acceptance algorithm, which has the property. This is actually a theorem I proved a long time ago, that if you use the student proposing deferred acceptance algorithm, then it is safe for families to, uh, to tell their true preferences because you can quickly convince yourselves that your chance of getting your second choice if you don't get your first choice in the deferred acceptance algorithm is just as big as if you had listed it as your first choice. Because when you apply to your second choice, they haven't filled their places yet. They're just, it's a deferred acceptance algorithm. They've held some applications, but they haven't accepted anyone. And if you have the highest priority, then you will bubble up to the top of their list and be accepted. And that highest priority will still work for you. Now, New York City had a different kind of problem. They had congestion, 30,000 kids a year were, were sort of left over. 90,000 kids go to high school each year in New York. Um, yeah, and 30,000 had to be matched someplace where they hadn't indicated a preference at all. So you, you didn't have any information on the preferences just because the system was congested. It used to operate by mail. And so they were getting unstable matchings and, um, and schools would withhold places. So here's a quote from before that says, you know, before you might have had a situation where a school was going to take 100 new children for ninth grade, and they might have declared only 40 seats and then placed the other 60 children outside the process. So that's, that's because of instability. They were withholding those seats because they were blocking pairs. If you were the principal of a school, you might prefer to match different kids than were going to be matched to. And if you had places available, then you could do that. So 
in both Boston and New York, we, we helped them build systems designed around deferred acceptance algorithms of the 1962 kind. These make it safe for families to reveal uh, their true preferences. They also make it safe for schools to reveal all their places. And so a very uh, pleasant surprise was in the first couple of years in New York that, um, that the algorithm was in place. It worked better and better each year, although no changes were made. And what you're seeing here is in the first year, how many people got their first choice, their second choice, their third choice. You look in the second year, and more people get their first choice, or their first and second, or their first, second, and third. And in the third year, even more people get their first choice, or their first and second, or their first, second, and third. And what's happening is those places that were withheld by principles are coming back into the system. So more, because there are no more blocking pairs. So, so the principles are learning from experience that the kids you can get later aren't better than the kids you could get through the central match. So, so having a deferred acceptance algorithm that produces a stable match not only made it safe for families to, to reveal their preferences, it made it safe for school principals to reveal all their places. Okay, I want to switch mathematical techniques now and tell you about a different kind of matching problem. You know, all of these problems I'm talking to you about are matching markets. So often when we think about markets, we think about auctions and other kinds of markets, uh, commodity markets, uh, stock markets, where the job of the market is price discovery, to find a price at which supply equals demand. But many, many markets don't work that way. So I teach at Stanford University, and it, 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 tuition is expensive. But Stanford doesn't choose its freshman class by raising tuition until just enough people remain to fill the seats. Um, so, so they don't adjust price until supply equals demand. It's a matching market in which you can't just choose what you want. You also have to be chosen. And of course, labor markets are like that too. The places you work don't uh, choose their employees by lowering the wage until just enough engineers want to come and, and work there. Uh, and and neither, can, neither can Google choose who will work for them. You can't just choose to work for Google, you have to be hired, but Google can't just choose you. Uh, they have to compete with Facebook and, you know, and other companies. So there are lots of markets where price doesn't do all the work. Those are matching markets. And I'm now going to tell you about a market where we don't allow price to do any of the work. I've already told you about one of those, which is uh, school choice for public schools. Right? We, we are not selling the seats in the desirable kin kindergartens. We're trying to figure out who should go to them given the district's priorities and the preferences of the parents. So here's another one, kidney exchange. And the background of this is, as with going to Stanford, it's expensive to get a kidney transplant, but, but you can't buy the kidney. So th it's a $50 billion a year industry in the United States taking care of patients with kidney failure. And the best treatment is transplantation, but there aren't enough organs. So in the US today, we have over 100,000 people on a waiting list uh, for a, an organ from a deceased donor. So on your driver's licenses, I hope you have a little dot that says you're, when you got your driver's license, you registered to be a deceased donor. That's a good thing to do. If you don't, you can go online now in whatever state you're in at uh, uh, donatelife.gov uh, in your state and, and register if you wish. Um, but there aren't enough deceased organs available. Uh, but kidneys can come from living donors as well as deceased donors because you all have two kidneys. And if you're healthy, you can remain healthy with just one kidney. And what that means is if you loved someone who was dying of kidney failure, you could save their life by giving them a kidney. If you're healthy enough, if you don't have high blood pressure or diabetes or protein in your urine, if you meet some medical and psychological conditions. But sometimes you're healthy enough to give someone a kidney but you can't give them your kidney because matching has to go on. The, the, you can only give a kidney to someone uh, with whom your kidney is compatible. And that opens up the possibility of exchange. So kidney exchange is an exchange between two typically incompatible patient donor pairs. So this first pair that you see on top, uh, donor one loves recipient one and would like to give her a kidney, but they have incompatible blood types, A and B. And Donor two and recipient two are also incompatible, but in just the opposite direction. So an exchange of kidneys would allow the patient who needs a B kidney to get one from the donor who has a B kidney, and the donor who has an A kidney to give one to the, the patient who needs an A kidney. 
that's a kidney exchange. And of course, in this example, it would allow two more transplants to happen than would otherwise happen because two donors who would otherwise be sent home saying, sorry, you're, you're incompatible with your patient, now get to give a kidney that allows the person they love, their intended recipient, to, to get a kidney as well. And no money changes hands. This is an in-kind exchange. And that's because in most of the world, almost in all of the world, it's illegal to buy or sell organs for transplantation. There is a legal market in the Islamic Republic of Iran, but pretty much nowhere else. So, uh, so there are laws against selling kidneys just about everywhere. And this is what the American law looks like. This is a sentence from the 1984 National Organ Transplant Act. It says it's unlawful for any person to acquire, receive, or otherwise transfer any human organ for valuable consideration for use in human transplantation. But an amendment to the law gotten in 2007 uh, and a memo from the Justice Department and some other things say that kidney exchange, while it might look like valuable consideration, is not what the law intends to, uh, to forbid. So kidney exchange is legal in the United States. So let's just take a moment to think about why selling, buying and selling kidneys is illegal. And that's actually a subject that I don't understand very deeply. But let's call a transaction repugnant if some people would like to engage in it and others don't think they should be allowed to. Kidney, selling kidneys certainly falls into that category. There are black markets around the world. There are people eager to buy kidneys and there are people quite willing to sell them. So often those black markets run by criminals don't work very well. But um, but it's a hard, it's a repugnant transaction precisely in the sense that some people want to do it even though others don't want them to. But without pausing to try to understand it now, although this is something I spend some of my time trying to do, um, when you see something that's illegal just about everywhere in the world, that might be a constraint you have to, to treat with respect. And so kidney exchange, which involves bringing some of the benefits of exchange to people who need transplants, is a way of doing that. It, it doesn't arouse repugnance. Uh, and it gets people kidneys. So the early history, incidentally, is they're, they're the first kidney exchange in the US was, was in 2000 in New England. And my colleagues and I initially started uh, working with New England hospitals. Another group of hospitals in Ohio set up a multi-hospital exchange. And the Alliance for Paired Donation, uh, which Itai Ashlagi and I uh, work with quite a bit these days, uh, was in fact the, the candidate for the Edelman Award that, that reached the finals. You know, it's, a, it's the organization that, that gets recognized in the Edelman Award. Uh, so there are logistical problems in kidney exchange. So here's, uh, here's a surgery taking place in 2006 in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm the man in the yellow gown. You can tell that I'm keeping my hands out of the way so no one hands me anything. <laughs> and, um, and, and in the bucket, you know, something you wouldn't want to get handed is a kidney. And um, just, uh, just behind me in the left-hand picture, but not in the right-hand picture, so off screen, is another operating room just steps away. And that's where the nephrectomy, the kidney removal, was just carried out. And the kidney was carried into this room, and it's being transplanted into this patient after being prepared. So in, in less than an hour from the nephrectomy to the, to the blood flowing in the kidney again. And this is in Cincinnati, Ohio. And at the same time, in Toledo, Ohio, the same thing is going on with the patient who belongs to this donor and the donor who belongs to this patient. And when I say at the same time, I mean literally the same time because you can't give valuable consideration for a kidney. So you can't sign a contract that says, we'll give you a kidney this week if you give us a kidney next week. So, so to make sure that everything goes through as it should, they literally get on their cell phones. You know, the, when the patients are successfully anesthetized and the initial incisions are made. Steve Whittle, the man in the tiger skin cap, gets on his phone and he talks to Mike Reese in Toledo, Ohio, and he says, we're ready to go. Are you ready to go? And when he gets confirmation, then they take the kidney and do the transplant. So that means there's a logistical problem here. To do even that very simple exchange, the simplest exchange between just two pairs, you need simultaneously to have available four operating rooms and four surgical teams because you're, you're doing four surgeries at the same time. So you can see that doing larger exchanges is going to be tough because you need to do a three-way exchange, you'll need six operating rooms. Uh, now, initially, therefore, our colleagues in New England said to us that if we want to help them organize kidney exchange, we should concentrate just on two-way exchange. And that gets you into some old, venerable 
operations research kind of graph theory, which allows you to say something like the following. This is not a graph with kidney information in it. This is just a graph where we're going to look at a matching problem, say what's a maximal matching, where a matching is a selection of edges between nodes that, um, that allows you to cover as many nodes as possible. Think of the nodes as being the patient donor pairs and the edges as being the, the compatibility. And what the Galai Edmonds decomposition says is it says you're going to have underdemanded uh, nodes that are covered in some maximal matchings but not others. You're going to have overdemanded nodes and perfectly matched nodes that are, um, that are always matched. And this doesn't tell you who they are. Let me now put in some kidney information. And to do that, I have to tell you about compatibility. Basically, here's a blood type map that says, you know, if you're a blood type O, you can give a kidney to anyone, but you can only receive a kidney from O's. If you're an A, you can give to an A or an AB. If you're a B, you can give to a B or an AB. If you're an AB, you can receive from everyone, but only give to ABs. You can't take a kidney from someone who has a blood protein, A or B, that you don't have. And there's another kind of incompatibility which has to do with tissue typing. So if the blood compatibility was the only thing that mattered, then here are the over-demanded and the under-demanded and the perfectly matched pairs. The guys in shaded are the blood types of, what, what, what I'm showing you in each box is a patient donor blood type. So for instance, there's an A patient matched to an O donor in a blue box and an arrow that says most of those guys are gonna be matched with O patients matched with A donors. So all the O donors are gonna be used up. When we, when we finish a maximal matching, there won't be any O donors left. And there will still be people in the unshaded region, O patients, because O patients can only take uh, kidneys from O donors. O donors are gonna be in short supply. So these are, this is what things would look like if only blood type were important, and if we didn't have any non-directed donors. And so this is related to the Erdos work in 1959 on giant connected components. Um, but nowadays, we also have non-directed donors. So here's a little compatibility graph where, where we're going to not insist on two ways. So an arrow goes from one pair to another if the kidney can go from the donor in that pair to the, uh, to the patient in the other. But notice this. So there's a two-way exchange you could do here and a three-way exchange. And there's also this non-directed donor. When you optimize in this case, you, get, you, know, you, could, you could get eight transplants here. I want to tell you about that chain on the bottom because sometimes we have non-directed donors who don't have a particular patient in mind. And those chains have become very, very important in contemporary kidney exchange in the United States. And what used to happen is when a non-directed donor showed up after he went through medical and psychological screening, they'd be told you can give to someone on the wait list and save a life and a transplant would happen. But now that there's this thick marketplace, this database of patient donor pairs, now non-directed donors can be offered a more attractive option. We can say to them, you give to someone to, to a patient in a patient donor pair, the donor of that patient will pass it forward, the donor of that patient will pass it forward to someone on the waiting list. And here's a chain of that sort that we did in New England in 2007, and there are six people in the picture, and the question is why only six? And the reason is those operations were done simultaneously, and six people require six operating rooms and six uh, surgical teams, and that was about all we could regularly muster. But when you're doing a chain, you might not have to do it simultaneously. The reason we do paired exchanges simultaneously is because if you didn't do them simultaneously and on day one, donor two gave a kidney to recipient one, and on day one that, that dotted red line means the link is broken, you know, donor one somehow failed to give a kidney to recipient two, that would be a real tragedy for pair two because they would have had a surgery that didn't help them. They no longer have a kidney. They can't participate in the next kidney exchange. But if a non-directed donor comes along, you can start a chain so that every pair gets a kidney before they give one. If the chain is broken, that's very disappointing, but donor two and recipient two haven't given their kidney yet, they can take part in the next kidney exchange. So if the cost of a broken link is so much less, we can start to explore the benefits of doing things non-simultaneously. And the first non-simultaneous chain was, was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in a paper with, you know, with doctors and operations researchers and economists and computer scientists as, as co-authors, and it had 20 people in the picture. Eventually that chain was extended to, to have another 16 people in the picture. Uh, you know, and here's what they look like. So, um, so you can get a lot more transplants out of a non-directed donor chain if you don't have to do it simultaneously. There's no way that we could have assembled 20 operating rooms at the same time. Now, 
chains have become very important. And the reason is the actual compatibility graphs are often very sparse. So here's a compatibility graph drawn from a data set at the Alliance for Paired Donation. Remember, each node is a pair, a patient-donor pair. An arrow goes from one node to another if the kidney can go from that pair to the second. And in this picture, everybody, all the donors and all the patients have blood type A. So there's no blood type incompatibility. But you still see there's only this small group of blue nodes that have a lot of arrows pointing into them. So there are very few cycles that involve the highly sensitized patients, the patients who can take very few kidneys. And to model that, you have to look at a random graph model that has easy to match pairs and hard to match pairs. And the way you form long chains is, the way you get the hard to match uh, pairs matched is by, by interspersing them with easy to match pairs. Uh, and again, that's, that's when Itai and I study this, we, we lean a lot on graph theory, random graph theory of sparse graphs from, again, Erdos and Rennie. And so chains can get very long. Here's a picture that was published in the New York Times about a chain that has 60 people in it. So there's a non-directed donor at the beginning, and it has, this chain has 30 nephrectomies and 30 transplants. Right? So, so that's why chains are becoming so important, because um, the majority well, so, so the majority of transplants in the U.S. through exchange, which now are, are about 10% of the living donor transplants in the U.S., the majority of those take place in chains. And uh, the vast majority of highly sensitized patients are transplanted in chains. So let me start to come to a conclusion and say that there are some general lessons from market design about what marketplaces have to do to make markets work well. They have to make the market thick. So for kidney exchange, that meant assembling databases of patient donor pairs. They have to deal with congestion. You know, in New York City, that meant they, they were, through the mail, they were telling kids what high schools they had been admitted to and having to make a choice by return mail, and that just worked very slowly. In kidney exchange, it was operating room congestion that mattered. And they have to be safe to participate in. They have to be safe for families to report their preferences to schools, for doctors to report their preferences over, uh, over jobs, for transplant centers to enroll all their patients in, in kidney exchange. That's still something that we're, we're working on. And some kinds of transactions are repugnant. You can't do everything that you can think of. There are, there are constraints on market design, like you can't buy and sell kidneys. So, so how about operations research and market design? You know, in the 1970s, game theory was, was still building out. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of engineering game theory. But the operation of marketplaces is today a very natural subject for operations researchers. They're, a lot of our biggest businesses are marketplaces. You know, Amazon, obviously, but Google as well. It gets all its money by being a marketplace for advertisements. Uh, eBay is a marketplace. Airbnb is a marketplace. Uber is a marketplace. Lots of businesses are marketplaces. Don't just deal with them. And many more make, make products that act like marketplaces. So, uh, you know, Apple and Microsoft make platforms for other kinds of software. Uh, and they also, you know, Apple sells an iPhone and Google has an Android operating system. Those platforms are marketplaces on which phones compete and apps compete. And so, so market design is the engineering part of game theory, but it's, about, it's also about the, the operations of many, many firms today. And there are lots of opportunities for operations researchers to interact with computer scientists and economists in, in this emerging uh, engineering branch of game theory. And so, uh, thank you very much.